if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would encourage you to open them with me, or in some cases turn them on on your phones, to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be looking here at verses 1 through 11 together. And so let's, I'll be reading from the Christian Standard uh, Bible uh, translation this morning, and I believe these will be on the screen as well. And so, when they approach Jerusalem... At Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever, has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here right away. So they went and found a colt outside in the streets, tied by a door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They answered them, Just as Jesus had said, so they let them go. And they brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches cut from the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple. After looking around at everything since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's pray together here. Father, we come to you this morning, and Father, I thank you that we can come here in your name. We come in your name because Jesus came, and place our faith in him. And Lord, I pray today that as we open up your word, that it would only do what you've already promised it would do, and that is reveal the hearts and intentions of us. May nothing be said here that is not of you. May everything be said here draw us closer to you, as you open our ears and Open our hearts as to what it is you have to say through your scriptures. I'd ask your favor to rest upon us in this time. And in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. When we come in, in here to Mark chapter 11, we understand that Jesus is coming to the height of his popularity. Uh, he had, a few weeks earlier, he had raised up Lazarus from the dead, and, and many had come to believe in him because of this. Men had, many had also come to despise him because of this. Uh, responding to Lazarus' resurrection, the chief priests and the Pharisees, the Jewish temple leadership became very fearful of Jesus' popularity. And they reasoned that the Romans would come and take their position and their influence and, and, it, and take away their nation as a somewhat independent uh, city-state within that empire. Uh, they began to plot how they would remove Jesus and not only heal, uh, remove Jesus, but also they planned to kill Lazarus because so many people were coming out to see the once dead man and Jesus who lifted him up from the grave. I bet that was just a sight showing up. Where's Lazarus? Because he used to be in there and now he's here. Where's he at? And all these people are flocking in to see him and to see Jesus. And on the one hand, uh, Jesus is at the height of his popularity and uh, with the people, with the crowds, we would say with the, the grassroots. His movements, on the other hand, were very secretive and, and hidden. And you can read more about that in John chapter 11 and 12. And up until this point of coming into the city in the way in which that he does, Jesus is, is very withdrawn. He's not hiding, but he's not blasting his popularity as well. If he was in today's culture, in today's time, he would, he would not be posting his moves on Twitter and Facebook and snapping the latest Instagram and posting the greatest filters with it and gathering followers. He would just be going about teaching. But now, because of his popularity and because of the opposition that is coming against him, he's withdrawn and he no longer goes in public as, as he has done before. 
the atmosphere that, that he is at, the atmosphere that we read about this event in, in, in Mark chapter 11 is absolutely ripe. It, it is ripe with tension as they are, the tensions are tight. Uh, it is an environment that Jesus comes out from the isolated area, stepping into the public in a very unique way into the heart of Jerusalem, which at this time of Passover has just swollen with people. They're, the, the, they're leaving the city of Bethany, which is about two miles from Jerusalem. Uh, they come to the region of Bethpage, which is somewhere between Jerusalem and, and Bethany. Jesus sends two of his disciples into an unnamed village with a specific command to find the colt, find the donkey, and bring it back it's just not any colt one that has never been sat on a colt tied up near the entrance of the village and they're to untie it if anyone gives them grief uh, they're to tell them the lord needs it and he'll, he'll send it back right away Many have, have talked about, and there's been much discussion and writing over the centuries, uh, how did Jesus know this cult was going to be there? Was he supernaturally aware that this cult that nobody had ridden on ever before was going to be tied at the, at the gates? And, and he would send two of his disciples, whom we don't know, to, to remove it and, and tell whoever gives him grief, hey, we, the Lord needs it, he'll bring it right back. Or, or did he establish this beforehand? arranged for that particular animal to be where it was and therefore when the disciples came in and they gave the code word the owners would not uh, balk at giving him the the donkey giving him the colt the reality is the science is the scriptures are silent against it they're silent about this moment we, we don't know particularly how did Jesus know this because honestly it's not important I spent more time explaining the different views and then how important it is. The, the main thing is here is that Jesus is, is coming out from the shadows and he is stepping into the very public arena in a very unique way. He, Jesus has the colt, he has the donkey for a very specific purpose of riding it into the city. Now we need to get the understanding here that, that when Jesus steps onto the donkey, he's not tired. Somehow I had that in my mind. Somewhere that crept in that, well, Jesus rode the donkey because he was tired and the people just swelled up against him and all of a sudden they were shouting and proclaiming. He wasn't tired. This was a two mile walk. I mean, he walks everywhere. They walk back and forth. As a matter of fact, at the end of the story, he walked back to Bethany without any issue. They're, they're, he's not tired. He is doing something on purpose with intentionality. And he wants us to know this and wants us to see what it is he's trying to communicate. Well, what is it that he's sharing with us in this ride to the city? Notice a couple of things about coming into the city. First, notice that riding the colt was not a shameful act, but an act of a king. You know, we would think that, that if I'm going to ride a donkey, this really is just kind of what they have left over. You know, we want kings, our heroes, to come in on, on white stallions. You know, we want the long ranger and his white horse riding in and rescuing. We want, want uh, we want, uh, oh, oh, I forgot the cowboy's name. Help me out here. Road Trigger. Roy Rogers. Roy Rogers. There we go. Thank you. Roy Rogers. We want Roy Rogers and Trigger, not Roy Rogers and the donkey. I mean, we want, we want kings to be strong. We like our pictures of George Washington and the white stallion. If he even had a white stallion, we don't know. You know, we probably, somebody knows somewhere, but that's not important here. That's what we want. And we think a donkey, that's just a waste of an animal. Unless you like donkeys, you know, but hey. G.K. Chesterton said this about donkeys in a poem that he wrote about, called, entitled The Donkey. He says, and fishes flew and forest walked and figs grew upon thorn. Some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me. I am dumb, I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet, and they were shout about my ears and palms before my feet. 
Here we, we have this image of the donkey and we think, well, what just a waste. They've got that, that, that horrible cry, those long floppy ears. They're stubborn. They don't make any sense. But we need to understand that in, in David's day, and the, the Bible describes David, the king of Israel, one of the greatest kings they've ever had, he rode the donkey. Every king post-David rode horses because they had to be better. I don't know why. But David rode the donkey. And so in, in a very, very subtle way, Jesus is making a correlation between he and King David in coming into this town, coming into Jerusalem on a donkey with its bitter cry and floppy ears. Secondly, Jesus was not only drawing these illusions and these connections with the king, it was kingliness, but he was also fulfilling a prophecy of Zechariah 9 and 9 that says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Hundreds of years before this moment was captured in the Gospels, this prophecy was proclaimed that the king would come in on a donkey. That seems strange to us. The third thing I want you to notice about the donkey is that the nature of the donkey. All these things matter. All these things are important. The donkey had never been ridden. In the Bible, animals who had not been ridden or had not been yoked for a task were often used for the first time in a sacred event. And we see these throughout the Old Testament. You can go back and read some of these events. The knowledge here of knowing that the, the colt had not been ridden orients us, changes us as a reader and hearers of this story to an understanding that, that this is a sacred moment. It's just not a little tidbit of information we can throw out on Bible trivia night. This is the information that should tune our ears, tune our eyes and our hearts that this is a sacred moment in this culture. Also notice about the donkey Noted that it had not been ridden. And Jesus proceeds to ride it into a crowd, shouting at it, gathering around it, cluing us in that Jesus had an authority over this animal. Now, I don't know about you. I've ridden horses a couple of times. Uh, I it could handle a horse if I had to. I don't really want to. I've, there's a man in our church growing up, and for my brother and I, he used to have jumping mules. That mule was crazy. <laughs> Nuts. You, you know that, that you've even seen, if you've, just on movies, if nothing else, you've seen horses get broken. They've never been ridden before. You know that an animal to come under submission of something is tremendously painful. And tremendously difficult. And those of you who do it, I have tremendous admiration for, and, and for you for the guts it takes to step up on that beast and tame it. Jesus here, for the first time, climbs up on this colt, rides into a crowd, people yelling at him, waving branches at him, and the colt does not buck at all. He demonstrates here that one who is able to calm the waves with his speaking, one who is able to demonstrate a natural order, order over the natural things, one who said to the fig tree, no more fruit would come for you and it dies. Jesus here demonstrates authority over the natural realm. There's some things we need to see in understanding of this donkey. It was a sacred moment. Jesus demonstrates his authority here. An entry into the city may seem unassuming to Jesus. He was making a very intentional statement as he stepped into the public. Jesus wants you to know who he is, who he really is. It's then, just as today, many have the idea of who Jesus should be, but, but don't really know who he is. The day that Jesus came into the city, he wanted to, to not just say he was coming, but say what he was coming for. 
He was coming for a sacred cause. He was fully God and fully man, 100% God, 100% man. The God man was coming to take away the sins of the world. He was coming for a sacred cause. He was coming because he was the king, not the king that they expected, but the king of the universe who sets everything under his feet. He was coming because God the Father had promised that he would come. That when sin entered to the world, that, that God promised a fix. That the fix was not going to do, try to do more and try to be better, but the fix was that the seed of a woman, a son, would crush the head of the serpent. He was coming in on the donkey because God promised that he would come. We just don't need to see the scene. But we need to see what Jesus wants to tell us about himself through the scene. Notice a couple of things here about the culture as well that, that pull us into this event. There are three unique cultural pieces about this. First of all, notice the odd thing they did with their cloaks. The two brought the colt to Jesus. They laid their coats on him. That's not strange. That's not odd. There was no saddle. He had to ride something. We'll just throw our outer coat on him. But then some began to throw their coats on the ground. Now, maybe you've seen some of this in, in old movies where the, there's a, a, a gentleman and a man in a suit and a fedora and they're walking up to the street and there's a puddle and he takes off his jacket and he lays it on the puddle and she walks across the puddle on the, on the coat without getting mud upon her shoes and the guy then picks up his coat and it's covered in mud and water and what, now what's he going to do with that now? We, we get that honor, that respect that comes within that. That's the same kind of thing that's being communicated here. Matter of fact, when you go back into the Old Testament, look at some of the scriptural passages there, you'll see how when kings made an entryway that coats were laid down before them so they could walk on them. We do something similar when we say we're rolling out the red carpet for them. We may not even have a red carpet or a carpet at all that's any, of any color, but we're going to throw it out because we want to give the absolute best and give honor to this person. That's exactly what's happening here in this passage. They are giving honor to Jesus, not just the 12, but those who are going before them. They're also grabbing palm branches. In all four of the Gospels, this particular event is recorded and we see different ways in which they get those palm branches. We saw the kids coming in, waving the palm branches this morning. I asked a few of them who was gonna wave it for me during the sermon and feed me grapes too. They didn't quite get it. I, apparently we didn't either. But the, he waves these palm branches. The palm branches were a symbol for the Jewish people of victory. They were used a couple of centuries earlier to describe as a moment of victory. So when they're coming in, as Jesus is coming into the city, these palm branches are being waved, they're being laid across the street, the road, the donkey is proceeding over them. They are symbolically proclaiming victory here. They might not have gotten it, what they were doing, but they were proclaiming this. They were also shouting in his Hosanna, Hosanna it comes from a word that means, oh, save us now. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, the one from heaven, save us now. Now, they may have been shouting these things. And they may have knew, known what they meant. But they might not have felt the weight of this moment. Uh, Dr. Robert Stein, great godly man, professor of New Testament, writes in his commentary about this. He says that, that Hosanna me literally means, oh, save us now. But by the time of Jesus' day, the phrase had become repeated at festivals, expressing a sense of joy and jubilation, similar to way in many countries when a Christian meets another believer, they greet each other with the phrase, praise the Lord. They're, they're not issuing a command or request, or request, but they are giving a statement of thanksgiving giving praise the Lord praise the Lord Hosanna Hosanna and so we have these these cultural things happening about them that Jesus knew what they were doing they may not have known all that they were engaged in well, the crowds may not have been entirely conscious of the full weight of what they were meaning, what they were doing. That saying was not lost. They were in people in need of a deliverer. We are in people in need of a deliverer. Jesus clearly understood not just what they were doing and saying, but most importantly, who he is and what he came to do. 
In, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says this, for the Son of Man, a title that Jesus used for himself constantly, has come to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was on a clear mission. His mission was not to be regarded as a good teacher or to have a couple holidays focused on him. His aim was to rescue, to deliver those who are lost, to save then is to be known that he need to be rescued. I just trying to place myself in that moment on that day. Place yourself in that moment on that day. Would you be grabbing the, the coats and throwing it down or grabbing the, the, the palm branches as someone says, here, grab this, sing this, shout this. And would this moment just pass? Well, that was fun. We do a lot of really cool things when we come to Jerusalem for Passover. What's next? Jesus somehow re returns uh, the colt, returns the donkey. And they comes into the temple. Listen again to verse 11. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple and looking around at everything, since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. It kind of seems anticlimactic, doesn't it? Almost feels like a letdown. We just had this tremendous outpouring, this crying out, Hosanna, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The cult is returned. Come to the temple. Look at everything here. It's late. Let's go back to where we're staying. It just kind of feels like a letdown. But it's not. He came and he looked and they left. After such a celebrated warm welcome, you'd expect more. I expected more. The entry into the city was, was probably a smaller scale than a lot of our paintings depict it. One that the Romans didn't notice as they were the authorities. One that wasn't brought up again in any of Jesus' trial, at least not that the gospel writers write. And this moment just kind of seems anticlimactic you expected more I expect more but here's the thing that I want us to see has been settled with on me this week and thinking about this particular text you know, and while the, the triumphal entry in the Palm Sunday was extremely significant and extremely symbolic so significant that all four of the Gospels record it all speak to it while it's so significant it seems to be just kind of a letdown and here's where this is settled with me. Don't let your encounter with Jesus be a anticlimactic this Easter. Don't let your encounter with Christ this Easter end with, well, it's late. Lunch is almost ready. Let's go home. As you come in here to worship today as you gather together and so many will gather together and worship next Sunday we we come with some just expectation we're supposed to be there it makes grandma happy we're glad to be here we come with the, all of these things bombarding us from all sorts of directions we we have major issues in our lives we're not even certain what we're to think about them how we're able to think about them if there is even an answer to them and we we just kind of come in and we know we need something But if we don't turn to Jesus, we'll leave here exactly the same. Jesus in, came into the city in a very unique way, in a very intentional manner, in a very purposeful uh, path to, to speak to the entire world and speak to us today to declare that he is the promised one. He is the one that God said would come and restore and make things right. He is the one whom, when we place our faith in him, removes the curse of sin, removes the debt that is placed upon us. He is the one, when we say Jesus is Lord, he is the one who's to save me now, is the one who saves us now. As you come in this Easter season, this Palm Sunday, don't, be, don't leave unchanged, unmoved, unrepentant. 
Don't leave a sheep without a shepherd just wandering and being tossed and turned by every course and wave of the world. We come to Christ because he is the only one who can save us now. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, I, I don't need a deliverer. I don't need a deliverer. I don't need someone to save me. What, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would I need somebody to say, oh, I, I need to be rescued. I'm not drowning. I'm not in, in held captive. I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. But if you continue to wrestle with that, you'll begin to realize, well, maybe I'm not perfectly fine, but I'm mostly fine. Well, maybe I'm not even mostly fine, but I'm kind of fine. Okay, well, I'm not fine at all. Maybe I do need to be rescued. Maybe I do need to be delivered. And that is exactly what the scriptures are telling us, that we are the ones who are in need of the Savior to come and save us now. Don't leave here today without responding to the call of Christ and recognize in, in, in the limited way that we have an understanding of who Jesus is, that he is coming not as he, as he came into that city to declare who he was. He is coming today to declare who he is and he is our savior, our rescuer, our redeemer, the one who lays his life down willingly so that we might be forgiven and live eternally. As a church, we need to be so cautious of being caught up like the crowds in just mindless praise. We're doing this because it's the right time of year to do this. We're, we're adding these things because it's the right time of year to add these things. It's the time in the calendar year when we do this. We need to do this. We need to throw that out the window. We are coming to worship the risen Lord and Christ Jesus, our Savior, who took the blow of sin for us and conquered death so that we might live and we might know God's favor and presence upon us even in our most darkest hour, an hour that we can't even imagine with our greatest imagination. And Jesus has come to save us now. In this story, it's just a unique little story. Um, Jesus steps into Jerusalem in a very unique way, declaring who he is in a way that, that maybe many didn't quite get, even though they participated. In a way that I hope as we come to the scriptures and understand that Jesus didn't come here accidentally. He came on purpose. And on purpose to save and redeem and rescue those of us who are perishing. If we turn to him and respond in faith. Where are you? Are you in the crowd, mindlessly shouting Hosanna? Are you one of the apostles following behind who believe in him and not certain where he's going with this, but you're willing to go wherever he goes? Where do you find yourself in that story today? I hope today that you would give your life to Christ. Perhaps for the first time, you would give yourself over to, to him, yielding to the salvation that he offers. Perhaps today as you're a believer, you've come, you've given your life to Christ, you know that point in time, but you've been kind of following him in a mindless way here and there and everywhere. God wants to do an amazing work in your life. He's called you here and placed you where you are for a distinct purpose. Don't ignore the purpose that God has for you and wants to work in you and through you. And together as a church, let us praise his name. And lift him up, for that is the greatest thing that we can do, is to proclaim the name of Jesus and how life and life abundant is found only in his name. Imagine what a difference in our families and our, our schools, our work, our town would be if we as a church boldly went out and proclaimed the name of Jesus with every step and every breath. What could God do through us? Let's close our service with a time of prayer and, and singing.